This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. When it's game day for your health coverage, trust Farm Bureau Health Plans to draw up a winning play for you. They've been backing Tennesseans for nearly 80 years. Head coach Brian Callahan, good to see you. Good to be here. A lot of questions about your uh, special teams in your press conference today. You mentioned that you're taking an all-hands-on-deck approach to fix what ails you in that area. Would you mind expanding on how you go about the all-hands-on-deck theory in a moment like this? Yeah, you, you try to find uh, solutions anywhere you can find them. Um, obviously, what happened on Sunday is not acceptable in any way, shape, or form, and um, we have to find a way to rectify whatever those issues are, and there's several, and they all play into each other. Um, and so some of it's about finding who else can help us. Um, is there guys that are starting that can play more for us on special teams? Is there uh, guys in our practice squad that might be able to make an impact? Is there guys outside of our building somewhere that could help us? Um, so that's all part of the process. And then uh, refining what we do fundamentally, what, our, what we do schematically, what are the things that uh, hurt us? why um, and then how do we prevent that and part of our issue on special teams thus far has been um, early in the season was protection uh, so we we fortified our protection unit uh, got some bigger bodies in there uh, put Jalen Harrell in there put Nick Vanette in there at the wing and um, you know all three tight ends are you know with Chig and Wiley they're, they're all in the in the middle to try to fortify some of the rush issues we had early on and and it's been good those guys have done a really nice job in protection but then there's a coverage element that, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of taking heavier, sturdier, more stout bodies, and, and now you have to go cover the punts. And we haven't gotten down the field with enough um, speed, tempo, all those things. To And then when we've gotten down there, we've missed some tackles. Uh, and then the other part of it is the punter has a job to do too, knowing that we can't maybe cover the, the punts down the field that way. How do we how do we help that with the punt? Do we got to hang the punt more? Do we directionally punt all those things? Um, so it's just it's a kind of total evaluation of where where we can help the unit and, and really you know specifically we're talking about our two return our our two coverage units the punt and the kickoff um, and that's where we've, we've given up yardage that you know it helps lose the games when you when you give up yardage like that. So as it pertains to hang time specifically, in asking Ryan Stonehouse to get more hang time on his punts. Are you asking him to change his punting style? Um, you know, I, I, I don't uh, I don't profess to be a, a punting guru, um, <laughs> but certainly there's there's some things that we we ask of him that because of the situation we're in to help our team. Um, that's one of the things that that we need uh, to do a better job of to put us in position to have us get a chance to at the very minimum force some fair catches so we don't you know put put our guys in, in harm's way. So. Um, there's probably some stylistic change to it. Uh, I couldn't tell you what that necessarily would be, um, you know, in the weeds of it all. All right. So yesterday you had a statistical advantage all day long and certainly at the end of the game. But because of the special teams issues, that didn't end up mattering. Is is one of the more disappointing elements on the day that you did some things well on offense and you did some things well on defense but special teams' mistakes kept you from just sort of playing the Detroit Lions straight up almost? Yeah, it was a really a weird game in that regard, you know, and I think it's it's not just the special teams. I mean, we turned the ball over four times on offense, um, two of which gave them plus field position on top of it. Um, and then to respond, we, we gave up five touchdowns in the red zone. And that's, a, a for better lack of a better term, a, a – a calamity of errors that that allowed them to score 52 points and a huge part of that is because we didn't help ourselves in any phase uh, help the other phase you know we we kind of went back and forth early um, it felt like it was a long time and then all of a sudden you look up it's only the top of the second quarter <laughs> um, but there was there was moments where I thought we we were really good defensively there was moments and where I thought we moved the ball uh, it was as well as probably passed the ball in terms of timing and efficiency. And, and Calvin had a big day, which was good to see from him. He bounced back in a big way after a disappointing week last week. And I just think that it's it's unfortunate that we didn't put ourselves in position to if we were going to get beat, let's get let's get beat, you know. Right. And and we didn't give our chance, ourselves a chance to even do that. Well, I guess that's what I was really asking. Let me say it another way: when it's fourteen, fourteen. Okay, you've had an interception, and that wasn't probably a great decision, and you've given up a 70-yard run. Not great. 
but it's 14-14. Mm-hmm. You're right there. And, I mean, if you go out and you kick them deep or they, they get a touchback, then we're playing ball 14-14. And they're probably the best team in the NFC. Maybe they win the game. Mm-hmm. But it, it seemed like the most disappointing part is – I would have liked to have seen that game. Yes, and I and I have a feeling Brian Callahan knows what I mean by that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I would have. I would love to see us, you know, go toe to toe in a game that that you know you, you're not going to have um, a perfect game. You're going to make mistakes, and they're going to make mistakes, and that's just the way the game goes. But I would have liked to have seen what our. I, I thought our team was in a great place. I thought they had great energy coming out. Um, the way the defense started the game, and I, I just there was a lot of things about that game that I was excited about, and I thought we moved the ball in a defense that I thought was maybe one of the better ones I've seen on tape all year, and I thought we did some really good things, and there's a lot of positive things to take away from it, uh, except for the fact that you know we didn't score more than 14 points, right. and you know there's just things that I was hoping that that we're ready to be ready to sort of take a jump, and I think we did in some areas, um, and maybe smaller than I would have hoped, but. I just thought we were ready to play that game, and I thought our guys were in a great place. And, and to just have it unfold the way it did um, is unfortunate because I think um, I was I was th- I felt like we were going to play a, a good football game against that team. You mentioned the performance of Calvin Ridley. What was it about that game, anything that enabled you to get him going so early? Um, first things first. I think uh, our protection was was good. Uh, we had a solid day in pass protection. Um, that always is the starting point. Uh, I thought Mason played on time. He looked comfortable. Um, he was accurate with the ball, uh, especially early in that game. I mean, he, he was he was finding himself a bit of a rhythm. I think our offense found a bit of a rhythm on top of it, and um, Calvin was the beneficiary. He got some some matchups. We got him matched up on um, on the long ball down the right sideline, got him matched up on, on their nickel, which is good. Um uh, on the on the inside fade, we got a matchup against Branch, which is the, you know kind of their safety. So he he got some matchups that were favorable, and he won, and he made big plays. And um, you know he he just he played with a ton of confidence. That was a Calvin that we've been waiting to see. How do you keep that going with him? Uh, I think he's in a great place right now, and I think the, you know he's going to keep making plays on the ball as they get thrown to him. And uh, you know I think he refocused his process. Uh, you know. I'll, I don't know if he'd be mad at me for sharing this or not, but you know he he looked back uh, and felt like you know I, I just maybe I'm not doing the right things or enough things in my preparation and you know every morning this week I look outside of my office and about 7 a.m. the jugs machine's running and Calvin's out there catching uh, I think he catches you know 200 200 ish balls out there in the morning before he starts his day and you know I th- I, th- I thought that was. Um, that's how you. That's how you do something about it. That's how you go about. I, I need to do something different or more. And, and how do I best do that while making sure I, I improve and play well for uh, for our team? And I thought that was a great example of a of a guy trying to find a way out of of the struggle. And he's been on a little bit of a struggle. And um, I just really appreciate how he goes about his business. And it was. Just, uh, I think it paid off. How do you plan to start the week at the right tackle position? Uh, same as last week, really. I mean, there's only so many you know options we have, and you know, Leroy did some good things, and John did some good things. They both played some. We'll probably keep that up, and um, there was things that that improved. Um, uh, there was also some things that that we got. We still had some penalties and some things that weren't great. Uh, so we're just going to keep that as it is, and then you know, as Isaiah gets more comfortable, we'll see where he's at. Isaiah Prince, excuse me, but uh, we'll see where he's at. So yeah, you mentioned him. You signed him last week to the practice squad. He's a guy you have familiarity with from uh, the days in Cincinnati. He actually started your Super Bowl mm-hmm. there. What does he have to start doing to legitimately get into that competition? Uh, just didn't, you know, knowing knowing what to do. That's the first part. Um, understanding how things get taught and and techniques and all those things and. Um, you know, I think something he could get up to speed. He's, he did a good job this last week, and uh, we'll just kind of see where it keeps progressing. But yeah, I mean, he's got some experience. He's played, uh, and in my, you know, there's a, there's a lot of football season left, and and you know, we, we all know that injuries can be a part of it, and so sure. we're, we're going to need all these guys to be able to play for us. Let's talk about leadership a little bit because mm-hmm. there's a lot of guys, Arden Key, Imani Hooker, Quadre Diggs, Tony Pollard, that are showing leadership not necessarily by what they're saying but by their play on the field. How yeah. valuable is that to you right now? Uh, incredibly. I actually pointed it out uh, to our team in our team meeting today, just just two two plays at the end of the game when it's 52-14 to 14 and uh, Jeff and Harold and Arden and those guys on Deep and Roger are, are playing with the same intensity they played with at the first snap. Uh, and Tony Pollard's carrying the ball with the same 
uh, speed and violence that he carries it the first time. And it just, to me, that's, that's what, you know, when people ask me, like, how, how do you, how do you believe in what, the, in what you believe in? And why do you think the way you think? Cause I see things like that, uh, where I know we're made of the right stuff and we got to stop, you know, putting ourselves in positions like we have, where we're, we're giving balls away or giving short fields and, and allowing what I think is one of our strengths and it's the way our guys play, how hard they play, how physical they play to actually be able to benefit us. Um, and that's where I, my belief comes from is watching those guys do that and their leadership uh, in those moments is, you know, everyone's watching that. And to see that those guys continue to perform late in the game that really is, is over uh, was, I thought, worth pointing out and worth mentioning and, and shows the character of those guys as leaders. Um, that's the first thing is you got to take care of your own house a little bit and do, do your job as well as you can, as long as you can. And um, guys follow that. Hey, Titans fans, with a Kroger Boost membership, you'll score big with double fuel points, free delivery, and lots more. Go to Kroger.com slash boost for details. Kroger, official grocer of the Tennessee Titans. Tighten up. Home is at the forefront of all that we do. It's why we're so committed to caring for the places and spaces in which we work and live. Ashley, the official furniture provider of the Tennessee Titans. More with head coach Brian Callahan. What must Will Levis show you during the course of this week to have a chance to get back on the field Sunday against the Patriots at quarterback? Yeah, um, one that he feels, you know, able to throw the football without much hindrance. You know, he can find all the arm angles and different throws and then um, the distance of the throws and then being able to make um, – the throws where you have pressure in pocket, it's, it's easy to stand out there and throw in shorts and, and just toss the ball. You know, it's it's about the rest of it. Can you play the position the way it needs to be played um, under under duress, which is, you know, you are a quarterback at some point in every game. Um, can you make those throws? Uh, and then, you know, just the, the having been off a bit too, is is, is, there, is there a rust factor? Is he ready to kind of go play ball uh, at the level that's required to play at the NFL quarterback position? So um, we're going to see. You kind of shut him down last week, mm-hmm. more or less. I did, yes. And what was behind that decision? Um, just to make sure that the injury that he has just requires rest. Um, the more you try to kind of push through and fire through it and, and keep throwing, it doesn't ever give it a chance to to heal enough to be able to feel good. Um, and so the intent was just to say, like, I know you're going to be out and we're going to keep you out and you're not going to throw, as opposed to like trying to see if you can go and see if you can go because that's kind of what happened – uh, coming off the bye with the Indy week, see if I can go, see if I can go. I feel good. I go, I play, I come back the next week. It's like I'm trying to push through, but it's it's now not improved. It's only gotten, you know, harder to fight through because it's, it's, you get tired and it's not the same. So I was like, and we made him practice that. We tried to see if he could fight through it and then ultimately couldn't. And so it was like, you know, we just need to just need rest. And that's, that's the best remedy for, for what he's got going. So uh, hopefully the, there's the time off has been, good he feels good and then we'll see when when we start to throw the football there's a medical rest but then there's also kind of a save you from yourself you don't even have to worry about the mental pushing Mm -hmm. of trying to get back and trying to fight through something right you would think that both of those would be helpful to him I would think so I think if you asked him he might he might probably say the same I I, you know there's all these all these guys they're they're tough and and they want to play and they want to be there for the teammates and they want to fight through injury and, and and everybody's got something right now it's just they all do. They're all fighting through something, um, some more than others, but that's just the nature of the business and what football requires. And so most players, because they understand everybody else is dealing with something, don't ever really want to – if they feel like they can help the team, they're going to try to go help and win. Um, but my job is ultimately to decide whether that's – they're at the level that can actually help the team versus one that would, would put them in maybe harm's way or put the team at a detriment because they're not at full strength. And so – uh, that's I made that decision last week, and I'll make it again this week if it feels like that's the case. Well, let's talk about some other guys that you have some decisions to make on. Yep. Guys like Legarius Sneed, Tajay Spears. Can we expect to see them back or getting closer to practice yeah, this week? Um, Legarius is still sort of on the mend. We'll see Wednesday where he's at. I'm I'm not as optimistic um, right now, but we'll see. Tajay, I'm much more optimistic. Uh, I would think that. Tajay's got a good shot um, at being available. He almost, you know, he kind of fought through repractice last week some and, and just felt like at the end of the week he couldn't quite go the way he needed to. Um, but I thought he was close, and so hopefully this week is the week for Tajay to, to, to make it back. Will new linebacker Jerome Baker have a role this week? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how he fits in. You know, there's 
Um, different style player uh, than 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 Ernest was. Um, see what the role is going to be. He's getting you know new similar defense in Seattle with with Mike McDonald, but uh, see where he fits for us and how much he can pick up in in a, in a week. And uh, again, last week was just sort of getting your feet wet and finding out you know where your locker is and all that stuff. And um, so we'll see we'll see how that that progresses. I'm I'm, I'm hopeful that we can find a role for him. What was the final decision on activating linebacker Cedric Gray from the practice squad? You know, just a, a young linebacker that may be and then one of those one of those guys that may be able to help on special teams with um, some some of the the way he plays and then how he plays with some instinctiveness and some speed and all those things that might help us. Um, so yeah, it was it was time to get him going and, and see if he can help us. Do you just say to a guy like Cedric Gray? Um you know, we'd like for you to really cover kicks well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you yes. say, hey, yes. hey, young yeah. fella, here's your opportunity. Yeah. You've been waiting a long time for this. Yeah, and that's part of it. That's uh, that's how young players in the league cut their teeth and where they start. Um, and then you just you gain experience and gain exposure and, and play in the game, and then hopefully you, you can grow into a role that, that helps you on, on the defensive side. First thoughts on Gerard Mayo and the New England Patriots, your opponent for Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tough team, physical. Uh, they they run the ball. Um, their defense is uh, still very much a New England defense. I see. There's, you know, they they have the similarities. It's always been a good defensive football team. Um, so yeah, you see all of the things about New England that's made them New England, and uh, they they look the part. Another week, another opponent whose quarterback situation is up in the air. Are you tired of this story yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even that doesn't even phase me anymore to be honest. It's just part of part of where some of these teams are, and um, you know, it's they got a young, talented player they drafted that they that has played pretty good, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, you can always you can always find uh, Jacoby finding his way into a game and playing well. You know, it's just kind of <laughs> what he does, and um, you know, th- th- at least they're not too stylistically different. You know, it's not like you're dealing with two very distinct offensive pieces. Um, they both are kind of passers and have some ability to move, but their, their offense won't change a ton depending on who's in the game. Thanks for your time as usual. We appreciate you, Brian Callahan. Yep, thanks for having me. All right, so on Sunday, the Titans take on Gerard Mayo and the Patriots. Our Ramon Foster was actually his roommate in college, so we got Ramon to stop by for a visit. Take a listen to this. I want to start with an offensive line question about the NFL, and it's about Bradley Bozeman. Oh. Bradley Bozeman, who is an offensive lineman for the Los Angeles Chargers. Chargers beat the Saints yesterday. Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert has a bad ankle. Defensive lineman Nathan Shepard knows this. As Herbert is releasing a pass in yesterday's game, Shepard grabs that ankle, and then after the ball's clearly gone, he holds on and maybe gives Herbert a bit of a twist, to which Bozeman is none too pleased, and the offensive lineman takes a line drive toward Shepard, knocking him off and getting a 15-yard penalty. So let's start with the first part for you as a former offensive lineman, does Bradley Bozeman have to do this? Yes. Okay. Yes. Y-E-S. Seven days a week. Okay. And especially on game day. uh, Two things about that. One, we always hear the NFL is a brotherhood, right? There's the ability to play against one another. And at the end of the day, uh, the livelihood of what we do is what's most important. That's the first thing, right? So the defensive lineman that grabbed the ankle, that's flagrant. And I know brothers fight all the time, but here's the other side of family and brothership too. Brotherhood is I must be able to also correct you when you do bad. And seeing Bozeman do that yesterday was the appropriate measure to take when you are a team that's new head coach, a franchise quarterback that you must take care of, and you see when the play is already, you know, the ball is already gone from his hands, the twist and the turn of the ankle, that's breaking the rules right there. So because of that, there has to be a consequence. And I don't fault him. I'm sure he's going to receive a fine behind that, but that's the appropriate measures to take right there, Mike. And if you have the right type of quarterback and teammate, he'll somehow cover that fine for you. Okay, so I was going to ask about that part. So he got a 15-yard penalty to Bozeman. He will certainly be fined for that. Does Herbert pay that fine? Do the rest of the offensive linemen pay? Does the offensive line room pay? 
pay the fine? Does everybody on the team chip in? How does that work on a real NFL team? Man, the way that works is the quarterback will find a way to give him that money. Uh, and he'll be taken care of, okay? And what it also does for Bozeman is it gains more stock for him for everybody in the building. You don't allow those types of things to happen. Yes, I was flagrant, but what he did was even more flagrant. I've been in situations like that where a guy would come and hit the quarterback late, and in defense of the guy that takes care of you, you must also take care of him, especially when it's egregious as it was yesterday. So, yes, the quarterback usually, and he's a second contract guy in today's NFL, <laughs> that'll be a drop in the bucket for what he receives, man. If, here's the other thing, too, if Bozeman um, gets a fine, because maybe because of the laws and the rules that, you know, Coach, I mean, John Ryan and NFL front office may have to just administer that fine anyway, but the understanding that John Ryan also played football and can understand context of why a player does a certain thing uh, may be in play a little bit right there. But so much is gained from Bozeman and as far as his teammates, especially his quarterback, and just the, the team and leadership. And who his head coach is, Jim Harbaugh. It was, Mike, it would be even worse if neither of the linemen did anything. That that's the way like you asked me, what is what is a football team, what does a quarterback do in those moments? Like, that's where you become closer. That's where the fight, us versus them, matters more in moments like that. And if they had had done nothing, can you imagine the talking heads, us, speaking about what is this offensive lineman? We don't call them the big old S word that you never call big men at a 300-pounders, soft. You know, we, we be having that conversation because there's a lot of unwritten rules in football the same way they are in baseball. So that goes to not only just the, the quarterback and the offensive line, that chemistry. There's a whole locker room. There is a competition of the team or the composition of the team, excuse me, reflected in that one action. Like he has to do it for the whole team. Easily. Yes, easily. Uh, again, it's happened before. It happens all the time. It's just a matter of can you survive those moments where bad stuff happens and then you get a fine or you get a penalty and you go on to win the game. Those are the things that have to happen. But what it does is it brings you closer, as I just said. Like, you know, like the team becomes closer. The offense, like, is taken more serious when those types of things happen. And it just – I've always been told and understand now – that the leadership and tone of your team starts with those big 300-pounders offensively and defensively. So if you as a big human being allow your small human being, your quarterback, wide receiver, running back to just get bullied and you do nothing, imagine, Mike, I'm not sure if you have a big brother or if you are a big brother, but if, you're, if your younger sibling gets beat up by an older guy or gets bullied and you just walk away from him, your, your little brother's going to feel a certain type of way about you. Where is my protection? And that's the whole embodiment of the position of the offensive lineman. Create space, protect, and be the guys that lead out front. And I think that's what we saw from the Chargers offensive lineman. He was not going to take it for somebody that couldn't defend himself in that moment right there. And you gain a lot. And I'm almost philosophical about this because I love seeing that. I had a guy in uh, Detroit ask me, how, how do you feel about the offensive line in the play? Well, after seeing that play from Bozeman, I feel a whole lot better across the league, knowing that the integrity of playing that position means a lot. That's interesting that you say that. Were you feeling at any point as though what it meant to be an offensive lineman in the National Football League was changing from maybe when you played or from what it has been historically over the last 10, 15, 20 years? Were you sensing a change throughout the league in what that position really meant? A, a little bit because it starts and it's out of their hands. It, it starts with the style of offense that you're choosing to run. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, every quarterback started off under center. Right nowadays, we see them clap their hands or give a cadence or, or you know raise the, the the leg as far as running the ball, and those guys have to do what they're told as far as offensive linemen. And there's not much control if a coach wants to run a, uh, throw the ball in a running situation because that's where offenses are. They're more analytics and style and um, ability to be able to morph into a different type of offense is where you've taken away from offensive linemen. To where back in let's go 2005. The premier players in the NFL were running backs. Well, 
who's leading the way with that big offensive lineman that move guys around. So, yeah, you do have those questions, Amy, as it pertains to what are guys being taught at the high school level, college level, and when they come into the NFL, do they still have that same aggressiveness? Or is it finesse and throwing the ball down the yard the way it's been perceived? It's still a big man game. Anybody that ever watched and analyzed this football like game that we play realizes it's one with bigs. You got good ones, you're probably going to be good. If you got bad ones, you're trying to find the good ones, you know. And um, seeing that from him shows that, like, guys care still. And the DNA of the NFL offensive lineman is still there. How impressed were you with the Detroit Lions yesterday? Um, they had their – transgressions I will say that first and foremost but their ability to stay consistent their ability to show the athletic ability and and just force and drive and control the line of scrimmage I was highly impressed uh coach Mack said in our pregame on Titans radio from right to left they may be the best offensive line now first play of the game Arden Key has something to say about that but that happens when you play this sport you're gonna get got but the consistency in which they played um the way they bounced around Mike Amy, the way they run up and down the field, and you can see them being the first guys out. I even saw something that was super unique, and I don't know if many people play, paid attention to it. But they started off um, their intros with the bigs, you know? Like, mm-hmm. they started introducing the bigs, and that crowd got so loud because the understanding of why Detroit is what they are is because of those five guys up front. And watching them be as athletic as they are. Pene Sewell, I don't even think he's 6'4". And – as athletic as he is and as strong and agile, says a lot about where it started to change as far as the importance, not just the left side, but the right side too. Like, and I think we're starting to realize that too. It goes from right to left. And Detroit probably has one of the best models, them and hate to even mention them, but Indy possibly too. You mentioned that Detroit was not without its transgressions and that there were some times where they got got. Is the mark of a good team not that they are able to play a clean game, but they are able to take advantage of opportunities when they present themselves and turn it into big plays, big moments, and points. It is. And it goes back to the – I'll use the Tennessee Vols uh, uh, situation right here. It's the game maxims. The team that make the fewest mistakes win. Mistakes are going to happen. When you got five guys trying to work at one as far as an offensive line, somebody's going to give it up here. There, It's a matter of – can we not point fingers? How quickly can we correct it? And how quick can we get something good out of it? And I think we saw Detroit on Sunday get something good quick and bad moments, and they didn't let it carry over. And the other side is they had answers for it. You know, the Titans come down and score, and guess what they immediately do? And it just helps you build confidence when this type of stuff happens. But that Jameer Gibbs 70-yard run is probably one of the more cleanest, just thoroughly blocked plays I've seen in football, period. And that's what good teams do is be in a back and forth and the execution of plays always come to the forefront of all things that you're doing. And that's what they did as far as that offensive line go, because that was just big on bigs with a little contribution from the tight ends. Detroit's never been to a Super Bowl. Does this team get there? They have the makeups of it. They do. I do think missing Aiden Hutchinson might show his ugly head somewhere down the line. But here's what we do know. They got the ability to go get guys because when you have a window or garage door that's open as far as the Super Bowl window, you do whatever it takes. And they know what they may be missing, production at the defensive end. But looking at their interior D-line, O-line, linebackers, and backfield as far as the running backs, Mike, we can say all we want to about, you know, Jared Goff can spin the ball down the field. And, you know, they got a – Ben Johnson can call the plays as their offensive coordinator – but with those those two groups I mentioned, those four groups, the interior D-line, the linebackers, they got good ones. The offensive line and the running backs, they got good ones. That's the winning recipe for winning Super Bowls, as much as we will talk about Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson throwing the football around. Yes, they do. Schedule-wise and where they stand, I mean, they're the number one team right now in the NFC. The number two team is Washington. Wow. <laughs> Dan Quinn and Washington have, if the playoffs started today, have the number two seed. They won yesterday with a Hail Mary over Chicago. Noah Brown with the big play. But most of the attention today has been in Chicago about Tyreek Stevenson and him busy taunting the Washington fans as the play started. 
Is there a punishment for Tyreek Stevenson for that? <laughs> and if so, what's an appropriate punishment for Tyreek Stevenson today? It starts in the team meeting today. Uh, putting him up in front of everybody, saying his piece, good or bad. But you got to be held accountable you for mean this that, one. That he needs to stand up and like he would be called up or yeah. – he just needs to raise his hand and say, I have something to say. How does that work? Both of them. Uh, and one <laughs> thing I hated about team meetings and uh. losses is the coach's voice just echo after that. They have that little red laser pen and that big screen to point out the bat. And if I was their head coach, Eberflus, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am fast forwarding. I am rewinding. I am fast forwarding. I am rewinding. And circling you with my red laser pen and say, what were you thinking? Mm. What are you thinking? And afterwards, I'd say, hey. What do you have to say for yourself? Because the team, a good team, is all about accountability. It's all about everybody pulling in the right direction. Those are the things that I saw happen in my team meetings. So I'd expect something similar because they had that game. They have a rookie quarterback that played well enough for them to win. And your lack in judgment and professionalism um, somewhat cost you in the game because the ball, if I'm not mistaken, directly tipped off of his hand. I like to call it karma, you know, but let's just call that lack of focus because if you were in your spot and watching that ball, maybe you would have had the ability to jump higher and tip the ball forward instead of backwards. It's And because of how bad that pre-play stuff was, Mike, Amy, I got to assume that you are the reason why. So because of that, come be held accountable. This it's makes, brutal, ain't it? It makes my stomach hurt for this <laughs> kid just thinking about it. I mean, if there's a punishment beyond that, I don't even want to know what it is. That sounds terrible. He did go to social media. He went to Twitter last night saw it. and tweeted an apology to his teammates, to the city of Chicago. He needed to be more aware. It's uh, I've got it right here. Read it. To Chicago and teammates, my apologies for lack of awareness and focus. The game ain't over until zeros hit the clock. Can't take anything for granted. Notes taken. Improvement will happen. Is that getting out in front of it, or is that trying to take the easy way out by putting something on Twitter and the saying – that's I addressed it. The latter part. That okay. The latter part. Because here's the thing behind it. And I laugh at this stuff that happens on social media because it's not reality. Uh, because that's as sincere as he can be. But why are you appeasing to that? That should be for your teammates. Like those are the things that have to be said in that team meeting to his teammates, the ones that matter that are putting on those shoulder pads for him. Like Fan accountability matters. But I looked at the replies on that tweet. Nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares. And that's the, the I guess, the wave of, like, the NFL in a sense. Like, social media is where you go to get your, you know, your inner thoughts out. And that moment I probably would have just shied away and just shut up. <laughs> so listen to this. If Chicago wins that game, they are 5-2. and two. And – they are a playoff team in the standings right now. Hmm. Washington is five and three, and they are not a playoff team right now because Philadelphia would have the lead in the division. Yeah. Oh wow. Did not know that. So you think about the significance of because that's a that's a conference it game. Is. Mm -hmm. And as the page gets ready to turn to November, you start to think about those sorts of things. Hey, Titans fans, SeatGeek makes it easy to find tickets so you can be a part of all the touchdown celebrations this season. Whether you're buying or selling football tickets, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek is the official primary ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. The most disruptive idea in ticketing, a ticket that works. Expect the expected. SeatGeek. SeatGeek. <laughs> <laughs> Made a rookie mistake this football season? Maybe you should have had a Snickers. Because now you can enter for the chance to turn those rookie mistakes into prizes, including a trip to Super Bowl 59. Visit snickers.com slash rookie mistakes for details. Want to wrap up with some Titans talk from you. Offensive line, stability, trying to get things together. Did you see any positive in Detroit? as the results over 400 yards would seem to dictate 
What were your overall thoughts on offensive line play against the Lions? I, I'll just put this one out there, even though it worked out. I don't think it's ideal to swap guys and that tackle, but it worked out yesterday. If somebody had a bad play, coach, what coaches did yesterday, I feel like it's facilitating competition still. If you don't have an answer for something, best way to do it is to put guys in situations where, where they have to answer the call. And I thought both of those guys, for the most part, did a really good job, John Ajuku and Leroy Watson. Um, as it pertains to the group in general, you don't notice good things out of an offensive line, especially when you're on your heels the entire game. What I did see and notice was they, they had the ability to run the ball until you had to abandon, right? The protection of the quarterback was there. And it may have been some close ones, but Detroit gave up four sacks and won the game. You know, so there is that idea, too. What we're seeing this group do, we might not notice until late next year or the following year. Because to be good at an offensive line, it takes reps. It takes time. It takes togetherness. And I'll be honest with you, it takes bad moments. I know nobody likes to live that life, but as somebody that played on a team that had what some considered, according to the three-letter analytics folks, PFF, Mm -hmm. right, like we were bad. And playing bad made us better because it made us closer. And I'm seeing this group yesterday, and I know J.C. Latham, if I'm not mistaken, was banged up pretty good. And he stayed, and Peter stayed, and they were backs against the wall in moments to where they couldn't afford another sack or turnover, and they didn't give up any. So these experiences that they're gaining and losses, you hope moving down the line, they flip. And, yes, Mike, I do think there's progress to be made. We just have no stats to show us that as an offensive line group, and that's the difference between – the position that they play versus what a defensive lineman that can say, well, I had three tackles, so I had two sacks this game. Right. You're on the sidelines, so you are closer than most to what is going on within the bench area and how guys are responding throughout the course of a game. With it, and it can start at the offensive line, but as it pertains to the whole team, did you notice interactions? Did you notice moments where this team felt like they were having those growth moments that that are so imperative to any young team? They were. And in that, too, you saw, even in the bad moments, you saw communication with J.C. Latham. I got to mm-hmm. point him out. I also got to give Lloyd Cushenberry a lot of credit, too. He's a guy, those two, I feel like, are vocal leaders on that side of the ball offensively. They're pulling the rope in the right direction and wanting it to be right. Nobody wants to lose. Losing, no matter of money, can make you feel good in the moment. So I'm trying to win games. And those dudes, you see that. You hear a young guy, J.C., pull guys and I'll even say this defensively I see them too I, I don't know if I've seen in the past couple of weeks Jeffrey Simmons and Arden Key lead better okay they are up they're challenging the DBs they're challenging the linebackers they're communicating with their own position groups and I'll even uh, after Arden's first sack they came off on the first series I sprinted down there just to hear what the conversation was going to be and you hear Jeff immediately saying bully ball I think I heard him correctly bully ball you know and that was the mindset it's just that when It's a team game, and stuff is out of your control. Those are the things that go under the water under the bridge. So, yeah, I do see it. And, again, it's a matter of good things happening while trying to develop. And right now it's just not a lot of good things that you can kind of lean your hat on. But the bones are there to answer your question. 